I'm standing in an odd patch of forest right now. You can see behind me, I've got about 25 meters of forest and then it abruptly transitions to a, a clear cut an area that's been fully harvested and replanted. And in the direction that I'm looking, uh, it's the same. There's another about a 25 meters of trees and then a clear cut that uh, was replanted maybe about three years ago. So this feature is relatively narrow, but it's uniform in width and quite long in either direction. And the key to that is this stream that's in front of me here. This runs through the middle of this area. This is a riparian buffer. Riparian areas are the areas immediately adjacent to and influencing bodies of fresh water like streams, lakes, or wetlands. And when forest operations are carried out nearby riparian areas, it's really important that precautions are taken to protect them. The vegetation surrounding a riparian area is extremely important in maintaining the function of that riparian area. For starters, the vegetation along the shoreline helps stabilize the shoreline or bank, preventing erosion and also limiting the amount of sediment that gets washed into the stream or body of water. In the case of a forest especially, the shade that is generated by those trees is really important. That helps maintain a more constant water temperature and also helps keep the stream cooler. The organisms that live in the stream have a certain range of temperatures that they can survive in. That's probably obvious, but you might not be aware that the water temperature also influences the or controls the amount of oxygen that the water can hold. As water temperature increases, the amount of dissolved oxygen that the water can contain decreases. So it's important for the organisms in there to have enough oxygen. Vegetation that overhangs the body of water can lead to insects or other small organisms falling into the water, becoming part of the food chain of the aquatic ecosystem. When vegetation like trees die or are blown over or branches break off, that coarse woody debris can end up in the body of water. That's important for all different types of bodies of water. In lakes and streams, fallen logs can be good places for organisms to hide or evade predators. It adds a little bit of habitat structure. In streams, that coarse woody debris can dramatically change the flow of water as well. It can cause some areas to have faster moving water and some areas to have slower moving water. And that's important for organisms to move between that. And also it creates different conditions on the floor of the creek. Some areas more gravelly, some areas more sandy. And that flow of water can also cause some areas to be more shallow, some areas to be more deep. So the coarse woody debris essentially helps create a more uh, complex or more heterogeneous um, set of conditions for the organisms who live in that stream. Aside from the coarse woody debris, smaller plant material, detritus such as dead needles or leaves or small twigs, those are also important because when they fall in the water, their nutrients are able to cycle through that ecosystem. Fine plant material or fine leaf litter is an important source of nutrients in aquatic ecosystems. Riparian areas are very important for many reasons. They tend to have very high biodiversity. The biodiversity right in the riparian area tends to be quite a bit higher than the nearby biodiversity further away. And these areas also often become corridors for animals to move along. In British Columbia, there are regulations that govern forest management operations near riparian areas. And there's a bit of nomenclature that goes along with this. Uh, first is the riparian management area or RMA. And this is basically the area where regulations apply in relation to the riparian zone. A riparian management area can have two components. A riparian management zone, or just management zone, is an area where operations like harvesting are allowed, but there may be some specific constraints on what is allowed. And then there's also the riparian reserve zone or reserve zone. And generally speaking, no harvesting is allowed in this area, although there may be some exceptions for safety and other considerations. The aim of the management zone is in part to prevent wind throw, and this is a big issue in a situation like this. You might be aware in a densely stocked forest, trees are competing with one another for light, so they grow tall as quickly as they can, but they don't need especially wide trunks or stems because they're protected from wind by the trees around them. So if you have trees that have been growing for 75 years in a dense stand, and suddenly all the trees next to them are cut down, now they're exposed to significant amounts of wind, and they don't have a stem of the size to withstand that. So they're much more susceptible to wind throw to being blown down or broken by the wind. So in the management zone, part of the consideration is trying to buffer against wind throw. So trying to control wind throw in that management zone, as well as protecting the trees in the reserve zone. Part of that might be 
uh, in selection of wind firm trees to leave, trees that have a size and crown shape and size that makes them less susceptible to wind throw. Sometimes trees in a riparian area can be topped where the tops of the trees are cut off to keep the tree in place but make the crown smaller so it's less likely to catch wind and be blown over. The riparian reserve zone itself, the objectives there are to maintain um, wildlife habitat structures such as uh, habitat trees and cover, maintain food sources, maintain coarse woody debris, essentially to protect the aspects that are important to a riparian area. Under some circumstances, a management zone is required, but a reserve zone is not required. And in that case, the objectives of that management zone are to maintain those important uh, features of the vegetation that protects riparian areas. So thinking about erosion, thinking about shade for temperature control, uh, sources of coarse woody debris, those are the things taken into account. So I mentioned in some cases there might just be a management zone, or there might be a management zone and a reserve zone, or there might be just a reserve zone. And that's all spelled out in the regulations. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but what I'd like you to know is that the characteristics of the riparian area determine those requirements. So for streams, they're given a class based on whether there's fish in the stream, whether the stream is part of a community watershed, and what's the, the average channel width of that stream. So all of those come into play. For a lake, it's a question of what's the size of the lake, um, is the lake in a particular Beck subzone where there might be other considerations in play? For a wetland, the class of the wetland is determined by the size of the wetland and whether it's a single or a simple wetland or part of a wetland complex. So all of those things need to be measured and classified to determine what type or what class of riparian area it is. And then from that, you can determine what the requirements are for the riparian management area. So this stream, for example, is a fish bearing stream and the channel width is between one and a half and five meters. So that makes this a class S3 stream. So if we look up the regulations for the riparian management area, it says that we need to have a 20 meter reserve zone and a 20 meter management zone for a total riparian management area of 40 meters. And those distances just refer to one side of the stream. So we need to have 40 meters on one side and 40 meters on the other. Now, this buffer is actually a little bit smaller than that, and that's uh, because of how the riparian management zone was managed when the operations occurred here. So we have 20 meters of reserve zone on each side, and then we have 20 meters of management zone. But in this case, uh, the requirement was that 20% of the basal area be retained in the management zone. And because of the, the landscape here, in particular, there's a very steep cliff along one edge here. If they had left trees throughout that management zone, they would have been very susceptible to wind throw because they would have been extremely exposed. And the trees in the reserve zone are actually pretty protected from that cliff. So what was decided was that they, they maintained or they retained the 20% of basal area, but they basically put all of those trees right next to the reserve zone and then cut the trees further away. So that 20 meters of management zone has just a few meters where they basically left all of the trees and then the rest of the management zone, they removed all of the trees. So they met that 20% basal area target, but it was just very concentrated in one small area. So for that reason, the buffer that you see is about 50 meters in diameter. So we have about 20 meters of reserve zone plus five meters of management zone where all of those trees were left on each side of the stream. That's just a quick example, and there's a lot more details in there that are really important about this. So if you do work in forest operations, you will learn more about this and get practice learning how to classify different riparian areas and then figuring out how to implement the riparian uh, reserve zone and the management zone.